This is the Welcome to the Sky podcast, your place for stories, news, opinions, and conversations about the best thing in the world, flying. I'm Lou Dix, your host and friend, as we talk about everything from flight training to the airlines and much, much more. I have a lot to say, so sit back, relax, and let's get this thing off the ground in the Welcome to the Sky podcast. In this episode, I'll be discussing two aviation accidents that have happened recently at the beginning of 2023. The first one is well known it's the ATR crash in Nepal I myself am an ATR pilot and I have some things that I think you might find interesting as far as insight into the ATR and what happened in that accident the second one is a mid-air collision that happened closer to home at an airport close to me in Florida that I've been to many a time and I have strong views about this particular airport which I think you'll be interested to hear however the underlying message that I want to kind of get across in this podcast is that as pilots whenever we're operating an aircraft no matter big small we are responsible for operating that aircraft safely not just the aircraft but operating in airspace safely making sure we're following procedures sops and doing the simple things correctly which i'll get into later in the episode so that's what we're going to talk about today i'm just fresh off a flight from brazil i've been in brazil for the past three days i just got back today literally probably about two hours ago so straight back to work no rest for the wicked but i was over there seeing my beautiful fiance alini who honestly i've got to give her a round of applause because she's got a lot of to deal with with me so alini this is for you well done for dealing with all this that i give you i i she waits so long for me to go over to brazil and then i go over there and all i do is i crack stupid jokes try and make a laugh and just make myself look like a goon so she puts up with a lot of stuff but so do i Look, I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means. However, the flight back, what happened on it, I'm pretty sure was premeditated, to be honest with you. There was two gringos on this flight back from Brazil. I knew the other guy was a gringo just like me because he's got milky white skin just like me. And I saw him in the airport, give him a little nod. Nothing more than that, though. No interaction, least interaction possible. It's 2023, we don't talk to people. But give him a little nod. I acknowledge his existence. He acknowledged mine. That's all I needed. Uh, and uh, yeah, sat in my seat, get, getting comfortable. I was on standby. I was using my uh, flight benefits. You know, seat's nice and comfortable. I'm, I'm next to two ladies next to me. I'm, the, uh, I'm on the aisle seat on the edge, which I'm okay with. I've got long legs, so I like to stretch them out. So having the aisle to kind of put my leg in is fine. Until the flight attendants come down with the trolley and smack into my leg and tell me to move it. So my fault, of course. Sorry. Uh, everything was going well until I'm surrounded at all quadrants by children. Now, if you're a parent and you're taking a child on an aircraft filled with other people, you should be spending at least three days in jail after the flight just to let you know how it feels to be inconvenienced. Just, you know, nothing bad. Don't put them with hardened criminals. Just put them in there with like, I don't know, money launderers. I was surrounded by children. There was one directly in front of me, one directly next to me, one directly behind me. And the father of the kid behind me kicking my chair the whole time. So hopefully that kid doesn't turn out to be a dickhead just like his dad. But just surrounded by children the kid in front of me would cry he'd stop you know family takes care of him whatever the two women next to me think it's all cute oh look at look at how cute he is yeah I'm not, it's not fucking cute next kid starts crying as if it's like clockwork and then he stops crying oh he's so cute he's lovely what's his name don't give don't care about his name just shut him up i'm trying to sleep and then the kid behind me starts crying as his dad's kicking the back of my chair as i'm trying to sleep i've got my neck pillow on, I've got my hood up, I've got my earphones in, I've got my, my eye mask. I'm supposed to be sleeping here, and I can't, because I've either got kids or the kid's dad smacking me in the back of the chair. Oh, it, it, was, it was awful. They, they quite obviously decided to choose one of the gringos to punish on this flight, and it happened to be me. So one point when I finally did get to sleep, in, in between the crying, that I was woken up by the two women next to me, literally poking me both of them poking me as i walk up i'm getting rid of all my layers i look over they're both laughing at me saying they need to go to the bathroom there's nothing funny about that hold it in have some respect just like my fiance has got stuff to deal with i've got to deal with stuff too so you've got to deal with uh, episode two of the welcome to the sky podcast i'm joking about that stuff mostly they should spend nights in jail, though. But uh, thank you for the support on episode one. I uh, I was really, really blown away with the support that you gave me on, on the first episode. 
like tons of comments, including questions for for the the next uh, episode, which is now. So I'm going to answer some of your questions from episode one on Spotify. Got 130 followers on there already from the first episode, which is fantastic. Thank you for following me on Spotify. If you do have a Spotify account, you do want to listen to this on the way to work, on the way from work. I don't know, on the way to the jail to see one of the parents of those children. Get uh, the Welcome to the Sky podcast followed on Spotify. It'd be great to have you over there. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, hello. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe to Ludix Aviation so you don't miss the podcast and also my normal aviation content. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Like I, I'm, uh, I'm out of my comfort zone here. I really am out of my comfort zone. There was a couple of people that commented that I'm, I was always touching the microphone in that first uh, episode. And that's because I'm really trying to think about what I'm saying. Your support eases the process. So I really appreciate your uh, support on episode one. I was reading a study which said that 80% of aviation accidents are caused by human error. That's a very high number. And it just got me thinking, like, it, during training, one of the biggest things that we do as a CFI, from a CFI standpoint, is to bring up risk management, risk assessment, risk management, and mitigation. Even as early as the pre-flight inspection, you're checking the aircraft, you're assessing risk, assessing, you know, is, is the aircraft safe to fly? You're assessing the, is there any water in the fuel tanks? Is there a screw missing? Is your instructor British? Big risk. <laughs> going through all these different things to make sure the aircraft is, is okay to fly. You're also pre-flighting yourself to make sure you're okay to go and fly. I'm safe checklist. We'll get into it later. And then you get into the flight and you you kind of uh, going through and, and doing your, your flows as you fly and then backing it up with checklists. That is, again, a way of mitigating risk, making sure that you're operating the aircraft safely. So everything that we do as a pilot is assessing risk. We try our best not to be part of that 80% uh, statistic. One thing that we all do, though, and I'm guilty of it, is looking into situations like aviation accidents, not knowing all the facts necessarily, and making assumptions based on things that you don't know. You don't know the facts about the stuff. I'm guilty of it. I'm going to give you my opinion on the situation based on what I know. That's it. So let's get into the Nepal crash. First of all, shall we? It was, uh, if you weren't aware, on uh, January 15th, 2023, Yeti Airlines 691, it was an ATR 72-500, crashed on a visual approach into Pokhara International Airport in Nepal. The aircraft was completely destroyed, which means that all occupants on board, 68 passengers and four crew members, that's 72, uh, they all are no longer with us, unfortunately. I have the preliminary report uh, from the Aircraft Accident and Investigation Commission in Nepal that I'm going to read through and take you through my thoughts as an ATR pilot and kind of try and get to the bottom of, of what happened. It's actually a really sad situation. The first thing that I saw about any of this was this video here. Now, the cameraman did an amazing job of this, but I can't knock him too much because I, if I saw an aircraft basically stalling and falling out the sky, I would do the same thing. I'd shit myself and run. But yeah, you can see it looks like the aircraft is stalling. And when I saw this initially, I was like, why is this stalling so close to the ground? It, it looks like it's stalling and looks like it's spinning. It, it's it's a tough watch. There's another video that I don't want to show and I'm not, I'm not going to show where you see the perspective of the people inside the aircraft and it's just horrific. I wish I didn't watch it, to be honest with you. Uh, but, you know, got to do some investigative journalism as a podcaster now. Yeah, uh, it's it's a terrible, terrible situation. So the, the couple of things to think uh, or to re uh, remember here is that the weather conditions were reported as absolutely fine. Really nice conditions to fly, great visibility, light winds. The flight crew were two captains on board. So between them, a, a good, decent amount of experience. So let's read the preliminary report here. January 15th, 2023, an ATR 72 was operating scheduled flights between Kathmandu and Pokhara International Airport. The same flight crew operated two sectors between the same airports earlier in the morning. So the leg that this happened on is the third leg. The accident occurred during a visual approach from way 1-2 at Pokhara. The flight crew was operated by two captains, one captain in the process of obtaining aerodrome familiarization for operating into Pokhara. He was the, the pilot flying on the left seat and the pilot in the right seat was actually a instructor captain. The takeoff, climb, cruise and descent into Pokhara was normal. During the first contact with the Pokhara air traffic control, they assigned the runway 30 to land. But during later phases, flight crew requested and received clearance to land on the other runway, which was runway 12. 
At 10.51 and 36 seconds, the aircraft descended from 6,500 feet at five miles away from the runway. At 10.56 and 12 seconds, the pilots extended flaps to 15 degrees and selected the landing gear lever to the down position. The takeoff setting was selected on the power management panel. Now, all of that, flaps 15, gear down, and then changing the power management setting is all standard procedure. That's that standard procedure as an ATR pilot. We do that day in, day out. Uh, flaps 15, please. Speed check. Speed, uh, speed 140, check. Light slope star, check. Gear down. Speed check. At 10.56 and 27 seconds, the pilot flying disengaged the autopilot at an altitude of 721 feet above the ground. 721 feet. Bearing in mind, they are not on the final approach at the moment. They're, they're on a downwind still. That that seems really low. I, I don't know the procedure into Pokhara. I don't know what it calls for. Don't know the altitudes. Don't know anything about that. So I'm not going to criticize that. But to me, that stands out as being really low. I'm talking about investigative journalism. <laughs> I didn't investigate that. So, but it just seems odd. The pilot flying then calls for flaps 30, which is the final flap setting at 10.56 and 32 seconds. And the pilot monitoring, the instructor pilot, says flaps 30 and descending the flight data recorder did not record any flap surface movement at that time instead the propeller rotation speed np of both engines decreased simultaneously to less than 25 percent so quite obviously something is not right here the pilot flying asked for flaps 30 the pilot monitoring says that's what's happening. The flight data recorder doesn't record any of, the, of that data of any flap surface movement, yet it was confirmed by the pilot monitoring. That's going to be important to this. And then all of a sudden, the NP starts to decrease. Uh, there's a single caution chime recorded at 10.56 and 36 seconds. The flight crew then carried out the before landing checklist before starting the left turn onto the base leg. When the propellers are in feather, they are not producing thrusts. This is where a stall is going to happen if you don't take action because you've got no thrust and if you don't realize what's going on uh, you, you're going to stall it at 10 56 and 50 seconds when the radio altitude called out 500 feet was enunciated another click sound was heard the aircraft reached a maximum bank angle of 30 degrees still turning to final with all this going on still turning final low altitude and now they've, they've got two propellers feathered the pilot flying consulted the pilot monitoring on whether to continue the left turn and the pilot monitoring replied to continue the left turn subsequently the pilot flying asked the Pilot monitoring on whether to continue the descent and the pilot monitoring responded it was not necessary and instructed to apply a little bit of power. At 10.56 and 54 seconds, another click was heard following, followed by the flap surface movement to 30 degrees. So that is at 10.56 and 54 seconds. That's 22 seconds. 22 seconds after the pilot flying had asked for flaps 30. is That's the only time that the flaps actually were selected and moved to 30 degrees. That's a long time when you're on an approach. 22 seconds is a very long time. And 22 seconds is enough time to realize that something is not right. However, there's been no realization here. At 10.57 and 11, the power levers were advanced first to 62 degrees, then to a maximum power position. He's trying to get power out of the engine. You're not going to get power out of the engine. It was followed by a click sound at 10.57 and 16 seconds. One second later after the click sound, the aircraft was in its initiation of its last turn to the final at 368 feet AGL. That's really low. It's no stabilization. Again, I don't know the approach procedure into Pokhara. It's noted that the pilot flying handed over control of the aircraft to the pilot monitoring. So now the instructor pilot is flying at 10.57 and, in, uh, and 18 seconds. At 10.57 and 20 seconds, the pilot monitoring repeated again that there was no power from the engines. At 10.57 and 24 seconds, when the aircraft was at 311 feet AGL, the stick shaker was activated, warning the crew that the aircraft's angle of attack increased up to stick, stick shaker threshold. You're stalling. <laughs> At 10.57 and 26 seconds, a second sequence of stick shaker warning was activated when the aircraft banked towards the left abruptly. Thereafter, the radio altitude for 200 feet was enunciated. At 10.57 and 32 seconds, the sound of impact was heard over the CVR. And then they, they, they stopped recording. Mistakes galore throughout this whole thing so the general consensus as to what has happened here is that when the pilot 
flying asked for flaps 30 the pilot monitoring didn't select flaps 30 he selected what we call the condition levers which without going into too much detail control feathering the propeller there's the fuel shot off position the next notch the feather position the next notch is auto the notch after that is 100 percent override and it would appear that the pilot monitoring has moved those condition levers to feather which has caused all of this to happen now my question about this whole thing is why was this not caught but before we talk about that let me throw this out to the atr cockpit so i can show you the layout all right, we're taking a little field trip to the uh, flight deck of the ATR, just getting it ready for uh, a day of flying today, uh, four legs, but uh, that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is the position of the flap lever and the condition lever, which it looks like the crew of the flight got these two levers mixed up, which in all honesty, in my opinion, having flown this aircraft for nearly 700 hours now, uh, is a difficult thing to confuse. This is the position of it. Obviously it's in uh, fuel shut off at the moment. When the engines are running, these two levers are here in auto. So you can see the auto position is fairly close to the flap lever uh, when the flap lever is in, its, uh, in the zero position. However, the feel of these two levers is completely different. There's enough space to stop the confusion between them. The way that you, the way that you handle them, you don't handle these the same way that you handle the uh, the flap lever, or at least for me anyway. When I'm holding, when I hold the flap lever, it's like this. When I'm doing, when I'm using these, it's usually like this. Obviously, other people are different, but it's a, it's a completely different feel. So, if you're going to grab the condition lever, thinking that it's the flaps, and um, you're holding it completely different. You, you you don't confuse that for the flap lever. So it's it's really, really weird one. Really weird and obviously very fatal. Anyway, you've seen it now. It's, it's just an awkward one. The ATR relies heavily on crew resource management. You back up your other pilot, whether you're pilot flying, pilot monitoring, you're always doing checks and balances against what everybody's doing. If somebody selects something, there's a procedure that you go through to make sure that what is selected is what the aircraft is doing. The thing that we do at my airline when we're selecting flaps is we ask for the flaps, uh, the flap setting, we check the speed, speed check, select it, and then monitor the extension or retraction, not by the lever, but by the instrumentation, by the gauge. So you select it, and then you look at the gauge to make sure that the flap is, the flaps are extending or, or retracting or, or whatever it is. So the, there's a procedure to it, and it just seems like there was no procedure here. I, I don't know SOPs at Yeti Airlines, no idea. However, being that it's an ATR, I would assume it. They've got very similar procedures to us, but again, that's that, I, I don't know that. But they had two opportunities to see that something was wrong. The first opportunity is going through that initial flow that I just said. Select uh, the position with the lever and then follow it up by monitoring the extension on the gauge. That obviously wasn't done because as soon as you look at the gauge, if you see it and it's not moving, you would immediately look down to the lever and see, okay, why is that still in the zero position? What did I move? You look over the condition lever, which is right next to it in plain sight, you'd see, oh, what are they doing out of auto? Throw them back up immediately. It said that they did a checklist. The part of that pre-landing checklist that they did has flaps on it to check the flap position. Even having done the before landing checklist, they still didn't find it. Let me show you what the before landing checklist looks like. Flaps uh, 35 before landing checklist. Let me check. Before landing checklist, camera crew is not applicable. Landing gear. Three green. Three greens, flaps are check 35. Fire management. Yeah, 1255, can I departure good day? Icing wheel 1255, one departure. Are all so my captain there who's pilot monitoring as he's going through that checklist and it says flaps he's checking the lever and he's checking that it's extended on the gauge and there was two opportunities for them to to find that and uh, and and they just didn't so it's it's just a, a really really odd one mistaking the condition lever for the flap lever going back to it again muscle memory and, and kind of going through the floor it's, it's it's difficult to mix those two up when the propellers are in feather as well the sound of the engines is going to be completely different as well you're going to hear a, a change you're going to feel a change in the in the way that the aircraft is flying so the, your initial reaction should be to be checking everything so it's just really 
really, really weird why this would happen. And in section two of this report, it goes through what they're going to go through in the investigation. It says the circumstances in which propellers went into the feathered condition. Next part is human factors. What human factors came in to play? And this is what I kind of thought about when deciding to talk about this in the podcast is that we're all responsible for making sure we're operating an aircraft safely. We're all responsible for making sure we're following procedures. We're all responsible for making sure when, you know, even as something as simple as making a radio call, making sure that we're, we're operating in a safe manner, not only for ourselves, but for other people, uh, you know, in flight, other pilots that are flying around and also the passengers that were, the, that were taken on board. Because the problem is the one time you make a, a small mistake, it could be the last mistake that you make. And this, honestly was a series of mistakes. You can make one mistake and then you can you can catch it by going through the necessary steps, the, the necessary, you know, risk assessment, management, mitigation. It's just there was plenty of opportunity to fix this and it just wasn't fixed. So, so you know, it go, going back to basics, those pilots don't have a chance of hindsight. They don't have a chance to go back and redo anything, which is a tragedy. But it, it gives us a, a solid lesson, I think, in making sure that not only the aircraft is fine and we're following procedures, but are we okay as the pilot? We're, I don't know, were those pilots in the right headspace? I know that the pilot flying was going through familiarization for that particular airport. He's probably under a lot of stress. You know, flying a, a big aircraft that requires two pilots to fly it properly and, you know, it's, it's, it is a big ask. You've got to make sure that you're prepared for stuff like that, going through the procedures before you go and fly. Were the procedures briefed properly? Are you following the I'm safe checklist? Are you ill? Are you on any medication? Are you stressed? Are you, have you had too much alcohol? Are you fatigued? Are you eating properly? All of these things we don't know about the pilots, but it goes back to the simple, the simple, the basics of are you okay to fly? I'm safe checklist. Um, are you following SOPs? Are you following checklists? Are you familiar with the environment? And also not getting too comfortable. I don't know. Again, I'm just spouting off my thoughts here. Pilot flying asked the pilot monitor and the instructor pilot if they should continue the approach. And the instructor pilot said, yeah, yeah, continue. Is there a comfort level there, even though something's going on? And, you know, I'm a firm believer that we should never get too comfortable when we fly. I Probably in my videos make it look like I'm really comfortable because I'm having a good time always trying to make flying fun. However, I'm always looking for an out in a certain situation, looking for places to land just in case. What am I going to do if this engine sets on fire now? What am I going to do if I lose my alternator? Where am I going to go? Am I going to go back to a controlled field and cause a big drama by nudging my way in, no radio? Am I going to go to an uncontrolled field and have the less stress? That leads me in to the particular uncontrolled field that we're going to talk to next. So let me know what you thought about my thoughts on the ATR. And I mean, it happened a while ago. You all probably knew about this before I uh, even said anything about it. But uh, and, and I think it's going to be interesting to talk about this as well, because a mid-air collision in the modern age, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to stop mid-air collisions from happening. It's a big initiative to get ADS-B in aircraft. It's just weird that in this day and age now, with all this technology and all, all these advances, that a mid-air collision has happened. Anyway, let me read a report here. I should have had this pulled up. Let's see. Oh, well, this is new to me. NTSB officials released new details on what led to the Winter Haven crash that four people. Interesting. It says that no, there's no more information. All right, well, this, the, this first one. Uh, all four people aboard two small planes that collided mid-air Tuesday are no longer with us. The crash happened over Lake Hartridge in Winter Haven, about 45 miles southwest of Orlando. A Piper J3 Cub seaplane operated by Jack Brown seaplane base in Winter Haven. Going to come back to them. And a Cherokee Piper 161 fixed-wing plane operated by Sunrise Aviation in Ormond Beach on behalf of Polk State College were involved in the crash. Four crash victims, not going to say the names, but one of those people was a student pilot of 19 years of age and the instructor on board was 24. The people on board the J3 Cub, 67 and 78. Big, big difference uh, in ages on the two planes. One plane was found partially submerged and the second plane was completely submerged. The cause of the mid-air crash is unclear. The NTSB and the Federal Aviation Administration will investigate. All right, well, yeah, that... that doesn't tell us too much, but I mean, it gives you 
it tells you what happened, but I'm interested in this. Sorry, we're, we're going on the fly here. We're, we're going off script a little bit because I didn't know that this was this was an extra thing. All passengers on board recovered. I want to express condolences. The Cherokee aircraft had completed one full stop landing and two go around maneuvers, which is what occurs when you come in for landing. All right, we know. It's, yep. So they were in the traffic pattern. Okay, that that's that's what I was actually wondering whether this happened with them in the traffic pattern, which I've got stuff to say about this airport. Radio transmissions show that the Cherokee aircraft was announcing its location and intentions while performing these maneuvers seconds before the impact occurred, but it's not known whether the other aircraft could hear this. Oh my God. Okay. That, 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 that right there is exactly what I wanted to know. I used to go to Winter Haven a lot, right? As a student pilot, I've been there. As a CFI, I've been there. And just on fun flights, I've been there. And every time I've been there, there's been something going on at this particular airport that has led me to think, I don't want to be at this airport. It's unsafe. Whether it's people cutting you off in the traffic pattern, doing straight in approaches, like not making radio calls is a huge one at uncontrolled airports. And this is what annoys me. And this is really just piss me off now to see that they're not sure whether the other aircraft could hear the radio calls, let alone make radio calls. Let me tell you a story. I was coming in on final one day with a student. I think it was runway 11 at Winterhaven. And from runway 11, I'll show you a picture on the screen. Just to the west of that is Jack Brown seaplane base. That's where the the that's the lake that they use to take off and land for the seaplane base. I was landing 11 as I'm coming in just as I'm touching down over the runway, no more than 200 feet above the runway comes a Jack Brown seaplane base J3 Cub just buzzing over the runway. No radio call, no nothing. I was livid. I was doing a touch and go as well. So imagine if the over the runway is I'm doing a touch and go and then we have a, a, a collision. Just unbelievable. I felt my blood boiling even more. Like just at how unsafe that, that was. There was no, no radio call made, which it appears there was no radio call. At least heard, uh, there was no radio call made by that particular J3 Cub. And I, I was just absolutely livid at how unsafe it was. Recently, I was questioning whether we had the same frequencies or the, the frequencies at Winter Haven were the same as Jack Brown Seaplane Base. It appears on the sectional chart that they are the same frequency. So why have I never once heard the Seaplane Base making radio calls? Do they have radios? If you don't have radios, fine. Operate safely operate around the fact that you don't have radios. You, you, there's got to be steps in place to make sure that this stuff doesn't happen. It says that the Cherokee was making radio calls and it's not clear whether the other aircraft could hear them and in turn is making them. That is crazy. That is incredible and that really annoys me. Other stuff has happened there as well, not, not just with the sea, seaplane base. I was there on a solo as a student pilot and I'm in the traffic pattern on a downwind doing everything as normal. All of a sudden, I see an aircraft coming straight towards me on the downwind and I'm like making radio calls and I'm like, aircraft, can you, can, you, can you see me? Can you see me? Can you see me? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Finally, they call me up and say that they can see me and I said, please, do you mind doing a 360 so we, we avoid a, a collision here? And thankfully, they, they made a 360 and everything was fine. There's been instances of people cutting me off in the traffic pattern, entering the traffic pattern non-standard, doing straight in approaches, not making radio calls. I've been on a downwind and had an aircraft come up and fly right next to me, just outside me on the downwind and cut me off to, to go in and land and they landed first. Like, what are we doing? That's the sort of stuff that's going on at this airport. Really annoys me. It's like pirates of Winterhaven down there, swashbuckling, slashing their way into the traffic pattern, pillaging the way onto final. It's not acceptable. I've always thought, having seen all of these things, that this airport needs a control tower because there's nobody controlling the chaos that is down there. And I said it was only a matter of time that something was going to happen and it's finally happened. And honestly, it sounds like it's pilot error. It sounds like it's part of that 80% statistic that we're all trying to get away from. That's crazy. It says, at these altitudes, it's not required that a pilot communicate or even have radio in this airspace. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not required at all. It f***ing should be. And again, right, instead of getting pissed off, th this all goes back to us doing what we should be doing as a pilot. So... 
my messages, follow procedures, make your radio calls, never get too comfortable in the aircraft because that's when you can become complacent. That's when things happen. And be respectful. Like be a respectful pilot in the sense that do things the right way. Enter a traffic pattern the right way. Tell people what you're doing. We all share the same sky. We share the same airspace. So we've all got to make sure we're on the top of our game. Follow your I'm safe checklist. Make sure you're okay to go and fly. Look, I'm on my soapbox here, but I'm really passionate about that. And it is an absolute tragedy that it's happened. They've got to look into this and got to do something about that airport because it's crazy how people operate in, in, in and out of it. Ooh, anyway, that was a lighthearted conversation, wasn't it? Like I said, I want to do Q&As in each of the Welcome to the Sky podcast episodes. So... If you're listening to this or watching it on YouTube, get yourself into the comments there and ask your questions. I'd love to answer your questions in the next episode of the podcast, which, by the way, is going to be with a guest. I'm going to have my first guest, which I'm really excited to to do. I think you're going to really like what we're going to talk about. So... Dull Geek, how old is too old to consider a career change into aviation? I'm 54, instrument rated private pilot with 440 hours. The retirement age for airlines, if that's your goal, is 65. You've still got just over 10 years. So what does that tell you? It tells you get off your ass, get moving and join us at the airlines because everybody's hiring. 54 is still really young. So you've got plenty of time to do it. And even if, you know, after 65, you've got other options after 65. So do it. James Wadsley, love the history lesson from the first episode. Appreciate it. If, you, if you've not seen the first episode, go back and watch it. I talk about my uh, flight training story thus far and how it shaped me as a pilot and a CFI. It's good, good listen, apparently. I thought it was boring, but people enjoyed it. So would love to know why you chose Silver versus another regional airline. Also can't wait to hear about your move from Orlando Executive. That I'm going to speak about in a different episode. I do want to be respectful to all involved in that. So I've got to choose my words carefully. Don't want to get cancelled. So anyway, um, but yeah, I do want to bring you that. So, but why did I choose Silver? It's very simple. Silver, uh, closest to home. They're the closest regional airline to home for me. And I don't want to commute to go and fly. I don't want to take flights on my days off to, to get to work. It doesn't seem appealing. And I want to be able to keep my YouTube channel going. And Silver allowed me to do that. So that's why I chose Silver over anybody else. Really, really simple. Any plans to put this on Apple Podcasts as well? I can do. Let me know in the comments of this one if you would want me to put it on Apple Podcasts. I put it on Spotify and I can put it on Apple Podcasts as well, but I mean, it's, it's only there's only any point to it if people are actually on there. Hey, Lewis, I'll be taking my initial CFI check ride in two to three weeks. What was the hardest part of getting your CFI? Any tips are much appreciated. For CFI, there's a lot of stuff you have to do. You have to pass two, in the US at least, you have to pass two written tests. You have to learn the psychology side of being an instructor, getting inside a student's head, learning defense mechanisms, how to build lesson plans, how to go, you know, they use the building blocks of learning, going from simple to more complex stuff. Knowing all that, was probably one of the harder parts to to wrap my head around. Because up until that point, you're not thinking about all that stuff. You're just thinking about your own selfish goal of getting to where you want to be in in aviation. So you're not thinking about how other people learn or what's best for other people or how best to structure a course of learning. So it was tough to kind of wrap my head around that at first. However, once you start to understand the little subtle nuances of being a CFI, you know, through the fundamentals of instructing, it it gets a lot easier and you use a lot of the techniques in the FOIs when you're out in the real world. And you'll see in the real world defense mechanisms from students. You see it all the time. Every session, you'll see something from a student. They'll do something wrong and they'll blame it on something else. Blatant projection. It's it's there all the time. Like it's, uh, it it is really interesting and, and you'll, You'll get to some points while you're flying with students and it's like, oh, I learned about that. That That's that in the real world. And it starts to make sense. So yeah, um, kind of doing that and also building lesson plans. I did all my lesson plans from scratch, didn't buy them, did them all on my own so that I could get them inside my head and, and do it my own way. So that was the way that I decided to do it, but it took forever for me to get all those together. What are your goals for the future? Captain at Silver, be head of your own flight school, flying jets. Uh, so captain is, is a big one. I'm actually eligible for captain upgrade now. So hopefully that's in the near future. However, that remains to be seen. But yeah, I'd like to own my own airplane. 
I really want to own my own airplane because I'm restricted at the moment. Having to rent, I rent my my aircraft that, that I fly on the channel. But if I want to do something on my own, like a headsets review, I just did a headsets review recently, which, by the way, I didn't realize Bose were coming out with a new headset. So I reviewed the Bose A20 against the Lightspeed Delta Zulu, not knowing that like literally a week later, Bose are about to unveil a new headset. So thanks to all the people that commented that in that video. That was a massive, colossal waste of time. But... Hopefully I can review the uh, Bose A, whatever it's going to be called. <laughs> We've got them right where we want them and we can raise the price even more if we want. Yeah, can I have a quick word? Hold on a second, Nige. I'm going to have to call you back. Okay, bye-bye. What is it, Devon? Myself and some of the team are concerned about the new headset launch. We just feel like the headset might not be that much different from the previous one. Devon, this is the Bose A30. It's going to revolutionize the world of aviation. It's completely different from our previous version. And it's going to significantly change the size of my wallet. <laughs> well, sir, that's the problem. We've raised the price and I don't feel like we changed enough to warrant it. What's your point with all of this, Devon? I've got to hear this. Well, you're holding an A20, sir. How dare you? Never use the words A20 in this office again. Understood? This is not an A20. We're going to take all of the ones that we have remaining, we're going to give them a new coat of paint, tell people that 20% more comfortable than the other ones, and say there's three levels of audio cancellation, just to say that we changed something, and voila, A30. Isn't that like putting makeup on a cow, sir? Leave my wife out of this, Devon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Apple's been doing this for years, and look at where it's gotten them. Listen, man, just get on board with this. It's not about the customer, it's about making a hell of a lot of dosh. Know what I'm saying? That's what I'm gonna do. Ah, oh, hold on a second, Nigel's calling me back. Cha chow Nige, how you doing? Yeah, I, when, I have to, when I do videos like that, I've got to rent the aircraft, which is obviously a lot of money out of my own pocket to go and make these videos. And uh, sometimes the videos don't make the money back, so... I'm operating on a bit of a loss on some of the things that I do, but it's it, I want my own aircraft so I can, you know, do whatever I want. If I want to fly it to somewhere to go and meet people and make cool videos, I can do it. So that that's my goal, really. I want, one of my big goals, anyway. <sighs> but then I think about, do I want to deal with all the maintenance struggles and stuff? I don't know. Hey, Ludix, I love your videos. Hey, thanks, man. Or woman what's your honest review of atp flight school as well as blue line flight school in north carolina no idea about blue line flight school but i love the color blue so they sound like a good place atp flight school is a part 141 school which is essentially they get you in they get you out as quick as humanly possible now that's good for time wise getting in and getting out as quickly as possible. I feel like part 141 is such a quick transition through the ratings that you don't... <laughs> Quicker is not always better. Quicker sometimes comes at the expense of quality. And having flown with some people that have come from 141 schools over to the 61 side, they are deficient in some areas that they shouldn't be deficient in. It, it, it's, it's definitely something to think about. You've got to weigh up what do you need as a student? Do you need extra time with instructors? Because at 141 places, it's highly structured. And if you don't pass certain checks, you have to go back and do stuff, which again is more money. Whereas part 61, you do it your own time, your own pace, whatever makes sense for you. So that, that that's as f deep as I kind of want to get into that because I've never had an experience at a 141 school I've, um, other than when I did my multi, but it was uh, like four or five days. Samuel Matthews, scariest part of flight training. For me, at first it was stalls. I was so scared of doing stalls, but after a few times of doing them, it, it kind of went away. And once I learned the aerodynamics of it, I, I'm a big, big believer in learning the ground portion of, of things before actually doing them. So reading about the stalls, learning the aerodynamics is going to help you understand what's going on while you're doing it and knowing that it's not just falling out the sky. And in all honesty, I'm going to open up a little bit here. When I'm doing spins, my heart starts to beat a little bit fast. So spins get my heart racing. So there you go. I'm nothing if not open. Let's finish off with uh, one more question. I'm a relatively new CFI. Around 100 hours dual given. Congratulations. What are some tips 
for instructing, you'd give new CFIs, not to be overbearing. An instructor, it's literally in the title. You're there to instruct. You're not there to take controls all the time. You're not there to make a student feel stupid by taking controls. You're there to use your words to try and coach students through things. Now, of course, there's going to be times where you have to take control because the student's not going to hit the rudder at the right time and it's going to try and spin away from you. <laughs> or they're going to try and taxi you into the grass and you've kind of got to take over a little bit. It's going to happen, okay? That's where you step in. However, if you can use your words to coach a student through it, you're not only going to see better performance with the student, but you're also going to raise the confidence because they are the ones that are correcting it, you know, based on your instruction. Be an instructor. Don't be, don't be so hands-on. I've had conversations with many different people over the years that have not enjoyed their instructors because they don't let them make mistakes. The mistake happens and then the instructor is bang, straight in there. And that's not how people learn, in my opinion. You learn from mistakes. Just let them go as long as you can let them go uh, to, to, before you're stepping in. The, you'll learn that as well. You'll learn how long you can let things go before you have to step in. It comes with experience. So just don't be overbearing, I suppose, is, is the overall thing. That's it then. That is episode two of the Welcome to the Sky podcast. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as you enjoyed the first one, if not more. Let me know what you thought about it on YouTube. Get in the comments and let me know. Thanks for being with me. Appreciate it. I've had a long day of flying back from Brazil, so now I'm going to go and relax and... Uh, I'm not going to relax, am I? I'm going to edit this. Whatever. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Appreciate your support. And I'll see you on the next episode.